It started as the latest brainchild for one of the world's richest men. A promised revolution for the transportation industry that would turn the established world order on its head. Back in those days, the somewhat fantastic idea of the Hyperloop was said to be able to bring passengers from New York to LA in under an hour, to circumnavigate the world in less time than it takes to smoke a brisket. Using a series of pneumatic vacuum tubes and a magnetic levitation system already used on bullet trains, small pods would be able to take their riders long distances at absolutely insane speeds. A concept that Musk himself described as a cross between a Concorde railgun and an air hockey table. But now, it's been more than a decade since the world's wonkiest billionaire tried to sell us the Hyperloop, and dear old Elon doesn't seem to have much to show for it, does he? His experimental Hyperloop tunnel in California has been replaced with SpaceX parking spots, and he's not said much about the concept in quite a while. Also, recent flights of fancy with Twitter and MMA fights with Mark Zuckerberg appear to have captured his intention instead because he knows what's important. But just because Elon Musk and his business empire have decided to back off the Hyperloop doesn't mean that everyone else has. From the US to Europe to the Middle East and South Asia, a number of companies around the world have taken the Hyperloop concept and started to run with it. In today's episode of Mega Projects, we're going to take a closer look at some of the global efforts to make the Hyperloop a reality and figure out whether they might get the job done, regardless of whether Elon is along for the ride. Now, for a concept that sounds so advanced, it might be a surprise to learn that the Hyperloop is a pretty old concept. First proposed all the way back in 1799 by an inventor by the name of George Medhurst. The idea of moving materials through depressurized tubes or pipes is the sort of thing that makes sense with a basic understanding of physics. Depressurizing a sealed tube means less air resistance when an object moves through it. Less air resistance means less friction. Less friction means that X amount of fuel can now move a vehicle farther and farther because it's not fighting against the atmosphere in order to do so. Similar sealed tubes have been used for pneumatic mail delivery and skyscrapers for decades. Just pop some mail into a little canister and in the blink of an eye it's gone from the basement to the 40th floor. Easy. Pneumatic railways have existed since as early as 1865 when the Duke of Buckingham inaugurated the London pneumatic dispatch system by travelling through it. A few decades later, Robert Goddard proposed the first Hyperloop design in 1909, describing a train that would move you from Boston to New York City in just 12 minutes. The modern push toward the Hyperloop began in 1999, and not with Elon Musk, but with a consortium called ET3 Global Alliance, a design group that proposed and patented technology to build a whole network of tubes which could be sealed, vacuumed, and used as an operating platform for maglev trains with no need for drivers in the capsules themselves. ET3 registered its designs as open source technology, and it was their work that laid the groundwork for Elon Musk, who first mentioned his own intentions to start working in Hyperloop technology in 2012. A year later, he revealed a design called Hyperloop Alpha, an electric powered Hyperloop system with pods carrying up to 28 people each. Musk hoped to offer Hyperloop Alpha as an alternative to a proposed high speed railway in California, which was embattled at the time and has since basically collapsed. Musk, too, registered his designs as open source models, and it's important that we do give a nod to that sharing of information. After all, the designs would form the basis for a lot of the innovation that's come from other companies. But after the boring company, a Musk venture focused on tunneling, built a test track, and hosted a few competitions in the late 2010s, well, progress has been a bit underwhelming if we're being generous. Even the most successful test of a Hyperloop-style system featured upon two small-to-fit passengers moving at a bit over 200 miles per hour, a lot slower than a plane and not so much faster than high-speed rail. Not only that, but critics have brought up a whole litany of concerns with Hyperloop technology. Now, we'll avoid relitigating all of those today. We've actually done a prior video on these criticisms a couple of years ago, so do check that out if you want to learn more. Possibly in response to their attempt being a bit of a dud, the Boring Company redirected their focus towards building expensive underground tunnel routes for regular cars, and though Musk himself has insisted that he plans to keep working on the Hyperloop in the future, there's not much evidence to suggest that's anything more than lip service to the idea. But even in the idea's early days, Musk's drive toward the Hyperloop got other groups around the world interested in getting in on the action. 
The first that we're going to touch on is a Los Angeles-based company called Hyperloop TT. Launched in 2013, almost immediately after Musk's open source proposals were released to the world, Hyperloop TT has taken a global approach to the concept. In 2016, they signed a deal with the government of Abu Dhabi to start a feasibility study on connecting Abu Dhabi with another city, Al Ain, and a couple of years later, they'd signed an agreement to connect Abu Dhabi to Dubai, also via Hyperloop. Also in 2018, they began work on a 320 meter long, four diameter test track in the city of Toulouse, France, which has since become the world's first and only functional full scale Hyperloop test track. Hyperloop D has since begun partnerships with Ohio and Illinois and the United States, hoping to connect Cleveland, Chicago, and Pittsburgh together, and with the port of Hamburg, hoping to work in freight transportation. Hyperloop TT has contributed to a number of major technological advances that bring a Hyperloop system within reach. In 2016, they announced that they'd developed a new material to build its capsules, referred to somewhat satirically as Vibranium, a homage to the material used in Captain America's shield in the Marvel franchise. The real-life Vibranium is described as a carbon fiber composite with embedded sensors, tracking temperature, stability, capsule integrity, and other crucial metrics in real time. Capsules would be coated in two layers of the stuff to guard against external damage. The company also adapted maglev technology into what's called a Halbach array, and while we'll spare you most of the physics on how this works, suffice to say that it allows a Hyperloop pod to levitate itself using magnets on the outside of the pod that don't need an external power source like current maglev trains. This technology, named Indertrack and supplied by the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, would go a long way in making Hyperloops cheap and easy to maintain while ensuring that pods would be suspended in the center of a track rather than using a rail. And Hyperloop TT hasn't just advanced the technologies required for a Hyperloop, but also the range of possibilities on how it might be used. In the city of Hamburg, their concept might be used to pick up and transport shipping containers from the city's crowded port to destinations further inland, meaning that those shipping containers and their contents wouldn't have to be driven through the streets of Hamburg. This could cut down on pollution, traffic, and logistical headaches for shipping companies, and it could be useful in just about every port city on Earth. Moreover, it's a type of Hyperloop technology that could be installed without needing to worry about the safety of human passengers, and because it would be installed over a few kilometers, or a few dozen rather than a few hundred, it would be a far easier tube to keep completely depressurized. Of course, Hyperloop TT is also working on routes that would support human passengers, but even these relatively unsexy options with their lack of transcontinental crossings would be a lot simpler to implement than the fanciful concepts that were common in the early Hyperloop days. At present, Hyperloop TT are a long way from building a full, functional commercial Hyperloop, but they're currently working to expand into Canada to begin designs on another, much larger prototype test track. They've entered a merger with a prominent acquisition company, and just recently they were awarded an 800 million euro bid to build a prototype in northern Italy. And now let's move on to Hyperloop One, which has been called Virgin Hyperloop as part of Sir Richard Branson's sprawling business empire from 2017 to late 2022. The company was incorporated by an investor named Shervin Pishivar, who had given Elon Musk the initial push to start developing and publishing his Hyperloop designs. Rather than going in with the boring company, though, Pishivar started his own company, operating for a while out of the garage of his co-founder, former SpaceX engineer, Brogan Bam Brogan. Within a few years, the company was rapidly expanded, and in 2017, it entered into a partnership with the Virgin Group, known for funding, well, basically anything if it sounds cool. Part of what attracted Virgin to the project was that Hyperloop One had already tested its propulsion systems and a levitating pod, 29 feet long, 8 feet wide, 8 feet tall. The pod's motor had been developed and refined from about 500 iterations, and it had already reached 190 miles per hour during early testing, while the tube it was in still had simulated atmospheric pressures found over 200,000 feet above sea level. Successive testing took that pod to even higher speeds, up to 240 miles an hour, and the company also built an airlock that could transition the pod from pressurized to depressurized space in just a few minutes. In 2020, the group had developed its second iteration, dubbed the XP2, and ran tests on the thing over 400 times. By November of that year, it was ready to attempt a human trial, one that one of the group's co-founders and one of its directors were confident enough to sign up for personally. The test was a success, hitting a top speed of 107 miles per hour. In January 2021, the group released its design for a 28-seater pod, designed to be modified into convoys that could transport thousands of passengers every hour. The project received a lot of interest internationally in the UAE, Finland, Sweden, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Russia, Britain, India, and Estonia, all of which signed on to various feasibility studies and planning agreements. Perhaps most prominently, 
they published a proposal for the 300 mile route under the Baltic Sea that would connect the Finnish and Swedish capitals, Helsinki and Stockholm, in a route that would take under 30 minutes to traverse. However, Hyperloop One's current goals aren't the same ones they had a few years ago. In February of 2022, the group abandoned their plans for passenger transport, laying off over 100 staff and announcing that they'd be focusing instead on using Hyperloop technology to move freight. In a dismal show for the company, Virgin pulled its brand name from the company, reverting it from Virgin Hyperloop back to Hyperloop One. The change, according to Virgin, was a matter of market demand. Although they'd become the first Hyperloop in the world to complete a manned journey, the short-term utility of the technology was in freight. But nevertheless, it's a blow to the idea of passenger travel more generally if a company on the cutting edge has decided to back out. One effort that appears to be going a bit better is a Canadian company known as Transport, which is focusing intently on developing its so-called flux jets. These vehicles, meant to mirror other Hyperloop pods, are built with the express intent of operating at high speeds in a way that Transport has pursued far more directly than other companies. Transport is also planning a Hyperloop project that can run compatible with solar power and other renewable energy sources, helping to further reduce the carbon footprint of a technology that should, in theory, already be environmentally friendly. Transport's flux jets are distinct from the Hyperloop in a critical way. They aren't meant to use compressed air underneath the vehicle like a Hyperloop, but instead they use a moving electromagnetic field. With a capacity for 54 people or freight, a flux jet should be able to operate at over a thousand kilometers per hour in tubes that are meant to be built side by side for bi-directional travel rather than in a single loop. The company has also built an internal guidance system called Violence Flux, which is supposed to control the vehicle's movement at high speeds and correct small deviations in its trajectory keeping it away from the walls of the tube using a variety of sensors. Lastly, Transport has built an artificial skylight for their pods, meant to emulate natural sunlight, perhaps a little less groundbreaking, but it's a nice touch. At present, Transport operates a one-third scale functional prototype using a, a, a test track near the city of Limoges in France. And, well, I suppose shout out to France for being willing to host so many Hyperloop test tracks. Transport is currently in the process of designing routes within Canada, going from Toronto to Montreal, Windsor and Waterloo, and going from Calgary to Edmonton in the province of Alberta. They hope to start operating a test track on Canadian soil relatively soon, and they've since proposed routes for France and Thailand as well. And so, from Canada, let's move on to Switzerland, where the non-profit research organization Eurotube is full steam ahead on its own Hyperloop effort. Unlike some of the other Hyperloop groups around the world, Eurotube is fully focused on freight transport, at least for now, and it's in the process of opening two test tracks in Switzerland known as Demotube and AlphaTube. What sets Eurotube apart is its focus on capacity, because if a Hyperloop is going to transport any significant amount of freight, it'll have to account for much higher overall weight and density than it would for passenger travel. Eurotube is hoping to expand the diameter of Hyperloop tubes so that they can carry entire shipping containers, either 20-foot or 40-foot versions, which, by the way, can carry a payload of over 28 tons in addition to their gross weight of 3.5 tons. This would require the Hyperloop's magnets to be strong enough to support a whole lot more mass than they would in passenger transport. Eurotube is also in the process of developing what it calls telescopic boarding piers, which would allow for them to solve the problem of depressurizing a Hyperloop tunnel for travel after first allowing it to be loaded by human operators. Eurotube's vision is to build a docking apparatus that can attach to its pods, form a seal, and allow direct access to the interior, basically using a sort of double airlock that never requires the outside tunnel to be depressurized. If all goes well, Eurotube will be operating its 3.1 km Alpha Tube test site by or before 2026. Once it's built, it will be able to support testing of high-speed vehicles at up to 900 km per hour. This should allow them to run tests at a sustained high cruising speed, something that other Hyperloop organizations haven't yet been able to achieve. Moreover, they'll be able to nail down some of the exact power requirements needed to maintain certain speeds for certain payloads via critical real-world testing that simply hasn't been done yet. Eurotube intends to serve as a research hub for other European and global Hyperloop developers too, meaning that once their AlphaTube is complete, some of the world's other pioneering Hyperloop designs might be able to do their own advanced testing. And finally, 
You probably saw it coming. But let's head over to China, where state-funded research on Hyperloop technology is well underway. According to a report that was released in April 2023, the nation is looking into the prospect of building a Hyperloop connection between the cities of Shanghai and Hangzhou in the first of what would almost certainly be a series of such connections. According to the report, China considers Hyperloop technology to be a matter of strategic importance, and in some ways, it's not hard to see why. China releases more CO2 than any other country on Earth, making a low-emissions, low-carbon footprint technology like the Hyperloop look especially interesting. Unlike Eurotube, China appears fully focused on passenger transport via Hyperloop, narrowing down criteria for a route based largely on population density between the cities that a line might serve. According to the South China Morning Post, and uh, we should include a warning about credibility here as the SCMP is very strongly pro-China, the country has already completed low-speed test runs of the maglev technology required for a Hyperloop, and they've completed a two-kilometer trial tube under the supervision of the Chinese Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation, with hopes to extend that test line to 60 kilometers in the coming years. China already operates the world's largest high-speed rail network, suggesting that there's certainly the will to develop similar capacity for Hyperloop technology. According to China, the link between Shanghai and Hangzhou is scheduled to become operational no later than 2035, and while we can't go much further into what technology China intends to use for this link simply because that information is not available, we can at least guess that China's ability to push massive amounts of state funds towards the project is not going to hurt things. So look, as we wrap things up today, it's important to remember that all the optimism in the world about the Hyperloop is going to count for nothing if these designs can't be built, tested, and confirmed as real, viable solutions to the world's transport issues. As people who've believed in the Hyperloop early on have learned all too well, this is an emerging technology with a lot of room for growth. One that's more likely to disappoint its supporters than reward them with groundbreaking results. But at the same time, it appears that Hyperloop engineers around the world have learned from the starry-eyed fantasies of the technology's early days and figured out how to manage expectations, chase the tech worth building, and convince world governments to send a not insignificant amount of money their way. It's a maxim oft repeated since the early days of Hyperloop discussions. In their early days, cars were treated with skepticism, and so were trains, and so were planes. None of those technologies worked at first. They each took quite a bit of refining, and they'd never have happened if someone wasn't willing to take a chance on them. And now the Hyperloop has become more than a pipe dream, no pun intended, for a single billionaire known for flights of fancy. It's a concept that many companies around the world would very much like to be the first to bring into reality. And for all our free market capitalists out there, that should read as rather good news. As the Hyperloop continues to evolve, it'll take on new and different forms that bear little resemblance to what Elon Musk proposed back in 2013. And here at Mega Projects, we're especially hopeful about the technology's use in short-distance freight transport, moving road and rail logistical hubs away from the congested cities. And that change alone could make the world's population centers a lot more bearable. And as this technology is shown to be useful in one setting, it'll become a more tempting investment to scale upward into other settings. Meaning that if some company, somewhere, can finally get a Hyperloop off the ground, they could really get the ball rolling on a technology that just might have been dismissed too early.